Last year, I was at school and had a seizure, which caused me to be homebound for about three or four months. And one of my friends was at school while I wasn't and witnessed a few of the boys making fun of it. And she had to go over there and tell them to stop because it's not funny. Hello, I'm Suzanne Bischoff, Executive Director of the Epilepsy Foundation of Virginia. This video is produced to help school nurses help children with epilepsy have a productive life at school. The DVD was produced by the Epilepsy Foundation of Virginia, EFVA, with the help of the Jean Ann Foundation. Dear fellow nurses, as a nurse, I am very excited about this project and I'm happy to introduce some eminent speakers who have volunteered in this program. Nathan B. Fountain, MD, is Professor of Neurology and since 1998 has been Director of the F.E. Dreyfus Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He is also Chair of the Professional Advisory Board of EFVA. This section will talk about several things. First, the classification of seizures in first aid. That'll include topics such as what is a seizure, how to recognize a seizure, different types of seizures, and proper first aid administration of medications and what to do in emergencies. In terms of a seizure, there are many people have different concepts, but the simplest and best definition of a seizure is one that relies on a medical definition rather than some common layman's definition. And the specific definition is that it represents an abnormal behavior resulting from paroxysmal, which means sudden, onset and offset, rhythmic, abnormal, neuronal discharges. And what that means is an electrical storm of the brain. So an electrical storm of the brain, that's a discrete event and represents a symptom of something else that's wrong. So seizures represent symptoms of something else. The something else that's wrong is often epilepsy. Epilepsy then, is a disease entity characterized by the spontaneous recurrence of seizures. And of course, there could be other things that cause individual seizures, things like alcohol withdrawal or being hit in the head or other things. And those are discrete single events that are seizures, but they're not due to epilepsy because they're not spontaneous. They don't recur. It's a subtle difference, but important as you think about treating it because mostly we treat seizures and not epilepsy. That is, we prevent the recurrence of seizures. Each epilepsy syndrome is characterized by the type of seizure that occurs in it, the age of onset, and its response to therapy. Let's start with how to recognize a seizure. That is, how do you determine that this event, as opposed to that event, represents a seizure? And a couple of important characteristics is that, first of all, seizures start suddenly, they happen for a while, and they stop suddenly. Now afterwards, people may take a while to return to normal, but the main body of it tends to be relatively brief. And during that main body of it, it represents distinctly unusual behavior. So that in most seizures, people would say, oh wow, that's really something different. So if, you, if you're not saying, oh wow, that's really something different, it may not be a seizure. Of course, that's not always true. Some seizures can be subtle. The most subtle finding during a seizure would be staring unresponsiveness, in which someone looks ahead and doesn't respond or doesn't answer. And the key to this, that differentiate from everyday daydreaming, is that you can't really get the person's attention by any usual means. You say, Johnny, are you okay? He doesn't answer. You tap on his knee and say, Johnny, are you okay? It's not necessary to do aggressive things like slap someone in the face like often happens in the movies, but instead the casual things that should get anyone's attention to distinguish staring from a seizure from staring from a daydream. Now in a few cases it may be difficult to distinguish normal behavior like daydreaming from a seizure, but in the vast majority of cases it's really obvious. For instance, the kind of seizure that many people think of most commonly is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure or a grand mal seizure which someone falls to the ground and has obvious jerking and shaking all over. That would never be confused with normal behavior. So let's talk about some other things that look like seizures but aren't. Some things that are somewhat commonly confused with seizures include syncope or fainting. That is, someone stands up, they get lightheaded and fall to the ground and faint. Usually that's easily distinguished from a seizure because during that kind of activity, people lay motionless. They're perfectly still, whereas during a seizure, they're mostly doing something. But it is true that in a few cases of fainting, people actually have jerks. And in that case, it would require a physician, typically a neurologist, to help distinguish the difference. But in most cases, it's easy to tell the difference. Occasionally, migraine headaches might be confused with seizures. Usually, migraine headaches characterized by a headache. So, of course, you wouldn't confuse that with a seizure. 
but there are a few seizures that are followed by headaches. And so if you don't see the seizure and just see the headache, you might be confused. Or there are a few migraine symptoms that might look like seizures. Before a migraine headache, some people see scintillating visual scotoma. That means uh, jagged lines or spots or dots. There are also a few seizures that manifest as seeing spots or dots or jagged lines. So there's a few cases where you'd be confused, but that's not usually the case. And finally, something that's uncommon is psychogenic spells. So some people have spells due to psychiatric illness that look like seizures, but uh, don't have anything to do with epilepsy. Under normal, everyday circumstances, that's very uncommon. There are a few things that are rarely confused with seizures, but we still think about medically. One would be cerebral ischemia. You know, not enough blood to the brain can certainly cause you to behave in an unusual manner, and that might be confused with a seizure. And that means things like a TIA or a stroke. But the difference is that a stroke gives you permanent symptoms, or at least long-lasting symptoms. And that's even true of a TIA. So the transient ischemic attack, or TIA, might give you symptoms for a little while, but not a few minutes. It's typically hours or maybe even days sometimes. So you wouldn't usually confuse a TI or stroke with a seizure. And finally, there are a few movement disorders. And again, the characteristic is that movement disorders are something persistent. They aren't something transient like a seizure, at least in most cases. And finally, sleep disorders can sometimes rarely be confused with seizures. Some people during sleep toss and turn and thrash in a way that looks somewhat like a seizure. And occasionally it'll require a neurologist or epilepsy specialist to figure it out. Seizures are classified by the International League Against Epilepsy, the ILAE, something you might hear about if you hear any at all about seizures and epilepsy. And the reason it, the classification system of seizures is important is because it gives us a common language to talk about seizures so that we can all use the same terminology to refer to the same kind of events. The second reason it's important is because the classification of seizures gives us some idea where the seizures arise in the brain. And medically, this is important as we think about what might cause them because things that arise everywhere in the brain at once, you can imagine, have causes that are different than things that arise in just one spot in the brain. Fundamentally, we divide seizures into partial seizures and generalized seizures. You know, partial is kind of a funny term. A better term would have been focal, but that's not the official term. But you can think of it as focal seizures and generalized seizures. The distinguishing clinical characteristic is that in a generalized seizure, the whole brain is involved in the seizure activity, and consequently, consciousness is lost. The person's entirely unconscious. They're unaware. During partial or focal seizures, consciousness is preserved. They're not entirely unconscious. So partial seizures are further subdivided into simple partial seizures and complex partial seizures. During simple partial seizures, consciousness is preserved as perfectly normal because only a very small part of the brain is involved. Whereas in complex partial seizures, people are confused or have staring unresponsiveness, as I mentioned before. Below each of these categories, there are specific seizure types. And it's not really very important to distinguish the different types, but it gives us a common nomenclature, a common language to use. And it's also important medically in, for physicians and healthcare personnel who take care of patients because it gives them a clue as to what's causing the seizures. So if we start with simple partial seizures, so seizures being in one small part in the brain, it's easy to understand how you might classify those because you classify them based on which part of the brain is involved. So if the primary motor cortex is involved, that's the part of the brain involved in motor movement, it causes jerking of one part of the body. On the other hand, if it involves the sensory area where sensation is detected in one small part of the brain, it causes abnormal sensation, typically tingling or numbness. It can also be in a deep part of the brain, in the temporal lobe, and if it arises in one small part of the temporal lobe, it tends to give autonomic symptoms. And you're probably thinking, what is an autonomic symptom? Well, it's things like heart racing, hair standing up, unusual feelings on the inside. And this is actually the most common kind of simple partial seizure that occurs. And that's because it arises in the temporal lobe and temporal lobe epilepsy is relatively more common than other types. We don't typically call it an autonomic simple partial seizure though. We just call it a seizure aura. So a seizure aura is just a simple partial seizure. So as people talk about auras, the feelings they have before a big seizure occurs, it's really just a little seizure. So seizure auras are just small focal seizures that sometimes go on to be bigger seizures or sometimes don't and just go away. Complex partial seizures have some subdivisions, but they're not really relevant. It's just a matter of whether or not people have automatisms or not. Automatisms are automatic behaviors, things like hand wringing, picking at the clothes, sometimes it's, it's gulping, or other kinds of sounds, it's commonly called lip smacking, but they don't really smack their lips. They tend to make sounds like that. 
So we classify complex partial seizures based on whether those are present or not, but it doesn't really matter for a practical purpose whether or not they're there. But it's important to recognize them because that makes it easier to recognize a complex partial seizure. Among generalized seizures, there are several more easily recognized types because they're typically more dramatic because they involve the whole brain and consequently are more dramatic. The kind of seizure that most people think of if you say seizure is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. It begins with whole body stiffening, a tonic seizure in which all the muscles are rigid. Because all the mus muscles are rigid, there's no balance and people typically fall backwards if they're standing up like a tree, often injuring the back of their head if they fall backwards. That's followed then by jerking activity, and that jerking activity is the clonic part. So the tonic part's stiffening, and then the clonic part is the jerking part. And this is what used to be called a grand mal seizure. You could just have one component or the other. So some people just have stiffening spells, tonic seizures, and some people just have clonic seizures. There are a few people, mostly children, who have atonic seizures, meaning seizure just the opposite of increased muscle tone. It's decreased muscle tone, which they suddenly fall to the ground if they're standing up or suddenly lose tone throughout their whole body. And these types of seizures can be very dangerous and difficult because obviously the child or even an adult is going to hit what's ever in the way on their way to the floor. And these are kids or adults that might have to uh, sometimes wear a helmet to keep from injuring themselves. Absent seizures, which used to be called petite mal seizures, consist of brief periods of staring unresponsiveness. So during these kind of seizures, people often will be doing what they're normally doing and then just have behavioral arrest and might not even recognize what they're doing. So it's just like that. There's a brief interruption in their conversation. For someone like me who talks relatively rapidly and probably a lot, it would be easy to recognize. For people, particularly children in whom it commonly occurs, it may be more difficult to recognize. They may actually have to be engaged in a behavior so this is the child who may be asked to go up to the blackboard or grease board and solve a math problem. In the middle of the math problem kind of just drifts off for a moment in a way that doesn't make any sense and then returns back to what they're doing. Or is walking across the street and suddenly inappropriately stands in the middle of the street and then kind of comes back around and finishes crossing the street. Absent seizures in general respond very well to medical treatment. So once they're recognized, they usually do quite well. Myoclonic seizures are brief lightning-like jerks with sudden whole body contractions. They're isolated or individual. They may affect just one body part or they may affect both upper extremities, for instance. They can rarely affect the trunk or the whole body and that would be a problem you can imagine because you might get thrown to the floor. Myoclonic seizures happen in both children and adults. Infantile spasms happen in infants and children, infants, inevitably outgrow them even though sometimes they transition to other types of seizures. Let's now turn to some first aid for seizures because the things we've talked about so far about classifying seizures are really just to give you a familiarity about what is a seizure. As I mentioned before we talk about seizures we most often talk about tonic-clonic seizures and tonic-clonic seizures are really the kind of seizure that require the most first aid. So that during a tonic-clonic seizure, it's important to turn the person on their side with their head toward the ground to keep the airway clear. And the reason is because during a seizure, sometimes people produce a great deal of saliva. We don't want it to roll into their lungs. And occasionally, they actually vomit. And if that happens, we also don't want them to aspirate that into their lungs. So by declining their head towards the ground, whatever they throw up or is in their mouth will come out. That's relatively uncommon. Occasionally we see people who go to great gymnastics to get someone on the floor and out straight with their head declined and that's probably not necessary because by the time you do all that you may actually injure the person so sometimes the most important thing to do is to let the seizure finish but in the right circumstance in other words most of the time when it's easy to allow someone to lie on the ground you should have them lie on the ground on their side with their head pointed down if possible. Another important thing is to protect from nearby hazards and you might say what does that mean? because by the time you recognize the seizure, they've already fallen. So hopefully you've caught them before they've fallen and you've lowered them to the ground. But other nearby hazards you might not think of because nearby hazards represent things like walls. So if someone's having a seizure doing this and they're banging their head in the wall each time, that's a hazard. If they're on a cement floor and they're doing this and banging their head on the, cent the concrete, that also represents a hazard. So you have to protect them from that. So typically put a pillow or something soft between whatever they're banging into. Also, if they're wedged between something, it's important to to take them out and particularly important if they have anything on like a tie or a necklace or any kind of wires to move them out of the way so they don't get wrapped around their neck of course. So if you're in school and someone has a seizure what do you do? 
Well, after you administer first aid, what do you do next? Well, some people need to be transferred to the hospital after a seizure and some don't. For children who regularly have seizures and have a typical seizure that's brief from which they recover, they don't need to go to the hospital. In fact, if they entirely recover, they don't even really need to go home. But there are a few people who need to be transferred to the hospital. So if you see multiple seizures, so if one seizure happens after the other, or if something called status epilepticus occurs, which is one long seizure that doesn't stop. If a seizure goes on for more than about five minutes, and certainly if it goes on for more than about 10 minutes, it's really unlikely to stop spontaneously on its own. Now, for most people, including medical professionals, it's very difficult to just watch someone have a seizure for five minutes and extremely difficult to sit and watch for 10 minutes. So that's rarely going to be the case that someone actually waits that long. But you certainly should wait three or four or five minutes during a seizure before calling the rescue squad or making some intervention or preparing to transfer them to the hospital. If they stop immediately, then of course you would need to do those things. But if they don't, then you're in a position to intervene and take them to the hospital. Of course, for adults, for our children who are pregnant, it's important to transfer them to the hospital. If they've been injured and need sutures, or if you need to determine if they've hurt their head, the emergency room evaluation. If they're diabetic or on any unusual medications, they also should be taken to the ER. What about someone who's never had a seizure before? New onset seizures. Well, almost all new onset seizures, certainly for those that happen in school, children should be transferred to the emergency room for complete evaluation to determine why that seizure occurred. A very important thing, and probably the most important thing about first aid for tonic-clonic seizures is to not put anything rigid in the child's mouth, and also not to restrain them. Of course, you don't want them to hurt themselves. We said part of the strategy here was to protect them from injury. But in fact, uh, beyond that, the next most important thing is don't put anything in their mouth. And the reason is because anything you put in their mouth, they'll just likely to bite off, including your fingers. And it's important not to put anything in their mouth that might pry their teeth open, because in the process of doing that, you're more likely to break their teeth. Now, if you break their teeth, or if they bite off your fingers, that will be bad. But if those parts actually go into their mouth and they aspirate into their lungs, that will be disastrous. So you're not doing them any good by putting anything rigid in their mouth. Unfortunately for many rescue squads,